Incredible creatures that defy evolution. This world, and in fact, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, God said that all people would have to do is look at His creation and understand that He exists. What we're going to do tonight is show you some examples of what He was talking about. Psalm 66, 5, come and see what God has done, how awesome His works. That's what we're going to look at tonight is His works. God created and made all life. God created the sea creatures and every living thing that moves. That's according to Genesis 1.21. Question is, does biology show any of this? God's signature in the cell. This is a basic representation of a basic cell. When we were growing up, I'm not talking about Ashley, I'm talking about the 57-year-olds like me. When we were growing up, we were taught something that was 100% wrong because they would use an oxymoron. They would say that there was a simple cell. There's no such thing as a simple cell. A cell, whether it be a plant cell or animal cell, is an incredibly complex set of machines, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in a minute. This just gives an overview of some of the different types of machine setups and information setups and supply trains that go within a cell. We all, when we were young, were probably given a project in elementary or middle school to where we would make a Play-Doh of a cell or a model of a cell. And our cell would have a cell wall and it would have some jello or something that we'd put in there for protoplasm or cytoplasm and then it would have a nucleus in the middle and then maybe it had a couple of other organs and we called that a cell. Up until the 1950s that's basically all they could see and we thought that that's all that was within a cell. Well we found out much more since then. This is a cell under an electron microscope. What we find is some things you recognize. What is this? That's a nucleus. But what else is lit up by this is the unbelievable set of canals or tubes that transport materials from one place to the other in the cell, from outside the cell in, and waste from the cell out. Occasionally, there are systems in which things just kind of diffuse through the cell. That is very unusual. In most cases, things only go into a cell through these tubes, and these tubes are very molecule-specific. That is, there are tubes that are meant only to carry water into the cell. There are tubes that are meant to carry only glucose into the cell. They only are shaped, in point of fact, to allow that molecule in, so that only the stuff gets in that's supposed to, and it's directed through these tubes to the places it's needed. Here is a look at one of those tubes, which again is not the way we normally think of tubes because again it will only allow to fit what? The specific molecule through there that it's designed for. Inside the cell there's a tremendous amount of diverting systems where different molecules are diverted to different places depending upon what the cell needs. And of course the great question is, how does it get the direction? How does it get the commands to know what it needs at what time if it wasn't designed with some type of computer system itself? Just to give you a feeling of how instructions are passed on the cell and just a bare taste of what's going on, I've got a two and a half minute video to show you what happens in what's called transcription when DNA unravels and is copied to make just one protein, which is one building block within a cell. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA.
When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. Now I got a question. How'd that happen by chance? And all we're looking at is the copying of instructions off DNA off of one very small piece of a three billion long strand of code to copy that and then form it into instructions to make a certain type of chemical that's needed by one piece of the cell. What you saw incidentally there was an under intense slow motion. The helicase, which is the machine that unwinds the DNA, that thing actually rotates at 3,000 RPM. Okay? These processes of transcription that we look at go on a hundred times a minute within our cells and millions of times a minute within your body all perfectly or you don't live. The probability of getting cells to construct themselves. <laughs> Let's talk about probabilities. You have a one in 600,000 chance in your lifetime of getting hit by lightning. How many people think it likely that you're gonna hit, get hit by lightning? Most of us don't think that's real possible, although it is. You got a one in 600,000 chance. That's one times six times 10 to the fifth because that's how many zeros follow in the six. Your chance of winning the lottery is 1 in 5.2 million, or 5.2 times 10 to the 6. Mine is 0. Why? Yeah, if you don't buy lottery tickets, you got no chance. Okay? Mathematically, if you have a chance less than 1 to 10 to the 50, if that is 1 followed by 50 zeros, it's mathematically impossible for that to occur. Let's look at the chances of life occurring. To just replicate a protein by chance, one of the proteins that's needed for life is 1 times 10 to the 450th power. Folks, that is billions, quadrillions, trillions of times bigger than what? The impossibility of math saying that this can't happen. But that's just one protein. Your cells are made up of DNA, proteins, organs which have functions, a tube system which we've showed you, a cell membrane which only allows the correct things in and out. The chances of getting a DNA in a cell by chance is 1 times 10 to the 167,626 power. Again, way beyond impossibility. The thought that any of this ever happened by chance is ludicrous. And yet, people don't understand that. One of the reasons they don't understand that is because those numbers, I'm a math person, that means something to me. To most people, they don't understand what this really means. Let's show you what that really means. We got a pile of junk, here, well, a pile of lumber, throw in some nails, we put in a bomb, we explode the bomb, and when everything settles back down after the explosion, we have a house built ready to move into. 
the chances of that happening are far better than getting a cell by chance. Now my question is, will this ever happen? And your answer is no. Because mathematically it is impossible, in fact common sense it is impossible. And yet they say a cell happened by chance. A lot of people will say, well, we put monkeys in a room. And in fact, they did this test in England, spent 500,000 pounds sterling on an experiment to see how long it would take chimpanzees typing on typewriters and computers before they would type out some intelligible sentences and maybe even all of Shakespeare. Well, after they did this until they ran out of money after six months, they got one broken sentence. Because the chimpanzees very often did not type. They liked to poop on the computers, they liked to kick the computers, but they did very little typing and when they did it was of course unintelligible. Here's a pure junkyard. A tornado goes through the junkyard. What are the chances that when this tornado goes through the junkyard and blows all of this junk up into the air, what comes down is a Boeing 747 gassed up and ready to go? The truth of the matter is a Boeing 747 is a much less complicated machine than a cell. And the chances of that happening with a tornado helping it along is much better than getting a cell. This is what the mathematics says. But if you start talking to evolutionists, according to my calculation, there's this zero chance of it ever happening. Well, actually, there's one out of 167,000 to power. The problem with probability arguments is, what will the evolutionists say? Yes, there's still a chance. Given enough time. Given enough time. Because they are so devoted to, we can't let God in the door, because then I'm responsible to him. God doesn't make useless stuff. Vestigial organs is a whole area where people said that there are useless parts in your body that have become useless because of evolution, like a tail or something like that. It's the theory of disuse. In the late 19th century, after Darwin, anatomists listed 180 vestigial organs. They said there's 180 pieces of your body you can cut out because you don't need them. I'm glad you're looking at me weird that with that. Today, that list has gone down to none because we found a purpose for all of them. Tonsils and appendix come to mind. People cut out their tonsils today. If they become infected, we need to very often if, if they don't respond to antibiotics very quickly. Folks, but what purpose have we found for tonsils? They actually are a guard to your throat and help to keep dangerous bacteria and other things out of the throat. If you remove them, can you still function? Yes but you're a little more susceptible to things going down your throat that you weren't designed for. The appendix, which we take out when it becomes inflamed and serious, also has two interesting functions. One, we've found that it secretes chemicals which gives us a mild form of resistance to radiation poisoning. Now again, can you function without it? Yes. But the second thing the appendix does is it is a storehouse for good bacteria. When something goes through your body like an antibiotic and cleans you out of bacteria, does it get rid of just bad bacteria? No, it's non-discriminate. It gets rid of everything, good and bad bacteria. And so very often when something happens to kill off, and you may not know that you have good bacteria in your colon, which actually help you digest food, the appendix resupplies your colon with good bacteria when it gets out of the system. Can you get that good bacteria by eating the right type of what? Probiotics, Probiotics or? Yogurt. Yogurt, yeah. My, not my favorite food, but anyway. There's ways to replace this. Thyroid gland, they thought 150 years ago you'd cut out the thyroid gland. Folks, that controls not only growth, if you cut that out in a baby, you do not have correct growth, and it controls all types of metabolism in adults to where they have to take all sorts of corrective chemicals if they don't have a thyroid. So you can't just throw that away. It's not useless. Coccyx is your tailbone. It's the anchor for the pelvic muscles and not a withering tail. Of course, what they used to preach was, well, you're from a chimpanzee and therefore that's the end of your tail and you just don't have a tail anymore. Those people who have had their tailbone removed can't sit down right because it's part of your design. It's not just a leftover. 
Now, one of the real interesting ones people keep talking about are wisdom teeth. Doesn't that show that we have disuse and the fact that we used to have bigger mouths and now we're having smaller mouths? What we've really found, though, is this has nothing to do with leftover parts from when we were another type of species and everything to do with diet. Because they have studied the diets of native Africans, which in Africa they eat a lot of uncooked, highly fibrous vegetable foods, and those people have to work when they're kids so hard to eat that uncooked vegetable diet that their mouths actually expand through use. And guess how many wisdom teeth problems they have in Africa? None. But you take those same black African Americans, transport them over here, and feed them what? Hot dogs and french fries and hamburgers, and guess what? They have the same incidence of problems with a too small a mouth and having to have wisdom teeth cut out. It is not that the fact that those back molars are vestigial, that they're useless anymore, that we are becoming a different species. It's the fact of diet. Let's talk about the human eye, or any eye for that matter. Darwin himself confessed that it was absurd in the highest degree to propose that the human eye evolved through spontaneous mutation that just happened by chance and natural selection. That's from his original book, Origin of Species. <laughs> in a later book, it said he, it gave him a headache just thinking about it. <laughs> After he said that, though, he went on for a chapter and explained how it might have happened. <laughs> because he had to. The eye is an automatic aiming, focusing, and aperture adjustment device. We can see in almost total darkness or in daylight. It makes 100,000 motions a day flawlessly. Then it does self-maintenance at night. Incidentally, do your cameras do self-maintenance at night? No. Not, your eyes do, but your cameras don't. It's so sophisticated, scientists still do not fully understand how it functions. The goal of all cameras is to do what? Duplicate what your eyes do, except for magnification. We try to get better than that. The human eye is amazingly complex. What if you take out some of these parts? What if there's no lens? You can't see. What if there's no vitreous humor that you can't see? Incidentally, the vitreous humor is made up of a huge amount of proteins suspended in liquid, and if those proteins are not arranged together in a very thick mass, they are not transparent, and therefore, again, you guess what? Can't see. What if there is not a set of photovoltaic cells, basically, on the back where all the light is focused? What if they're not there? You can't see. What if there is not an optic nerve that transmits all the signals that hit on these receptors? You can't see. What if there's no cornea? in front, iris or pupil. Until this thing is fully developed and fully put together, it doesn't work. And in point of fact, it works in very interesting ways. For example, what the lens does is when this light comes into your eye, it turns it upside down. And what hits the back of your eye at the receptor points is an upside down set of light, which is transmitted to the optic nerve in that upside down fashion your mind, though, turns it right side up because it, it has transmitting instructions to do that. How did any of this happen by chance? How did you just get one piece? Maybe there was a cornea to start with. Will that do you any good? What about receptors? What about every piece except the optic nerve? We can read everything, but nothing gets to the brain. Until every piece of that is there, it doesn't work. And that's what evolution says, that things are constructed by chance one piece at a time. That doesn't work for the eye. Parts are useless until fully developed, and Darwin admitted the same. There's no way this happened by accident. It looks designed because it was designed. One of the dumbest stories in all of evolution is the idea of the three bone mandible in a reptile and the three bones in our ears. They say they're actually the same bones. A reptile mandible, what's a mandible? That's our lower jaw, has three bones. Humans have one bone in our lower jaw. Humans have three bones in the ear, but if you've ever noticed they, or ever seen a picture, they are very small bones. And reptiles have one bone in their ear. 
Evolutionists theorize that when reptiles turned into mammals and then to man, that sometime when they were mammals, the two reptile mandible bones migrated. What does that word migrated mean? Moved. The two bones down here moved up here and became ear bones. Well, while they were on their way, what would that animal not be able to do? He couldn't eat or hear. Well, there's no new animal. That, there's no survival. And these three bones that were down here in the mandible of a reptile were so large, how did they get less than the size of a dime inside your ear? It's ludicrous. It's stupid. But they are so pressed to find a way to make a reptile into a mammal even though their design is completely different. How did they move, for incidentally? Did they grab a cab? How, how did they get from the jaw to the inner ear? And again, how did the transitional forms eat, hear, or survive? Just like the eye, the auditory system is useless until fully developed, until you have all those bones in the right place, sitting in a, in a cochlear implant watery device outside of a membrane of the ear and feeding into the brain with the correct nerve connections, you can't hear anything. It's a design system and incidentally a beautifully designed system. Sea slug, probably not your favorite animal. It feeds on sea anemones with stinging cells. It is the only animal that really can feed on the sea, the sea anemone because it can neutralize the sea anemone stinging cells. What it will do, the slug will go along and it will swallow whole the sea anemone. It has chemicals in its mouth and digestive system to where it will neutralize the stinging cells to where they won't go off. But then it really has a fascinating adaptation. It has developed a new digestive system. It has chemical mechanisms to neutralize stinging cells and sophisticated tubes and a pouches assembly. Here's what it does. It not only swallows the sea anemone whole, it has juices which digest all of the sea anemone except for the stinging cells. The stinging cells are left whole. It takes those stinging cells from its intestinal tract, its gut, and directs them to tubes at the end of its body and now uses the anemone stinging cells as its own defense system. And it has its own nerve receptors already in those tubes built into its brain so that it can control those stinging cells. My question is, how did this happen by chance? How did you design an animal that would dissolve another animal except it would recognize stinging cells, not only stopping them from stinging, but also keeping them whole and directing them towards pre-made tubes already in its own body, feeding outside. Here's a look at the stinging cells on the end of a sea slug. And here's the interior portion with the cap which comes off when it's attacked in some way and the stinging cells which are ready to extrude and give venom. The sea slug has a highly complex mechanism for arranging, storing, and maintaining the stinging cells. How do you get a stinging cell off of that anemone into the correct tubes? And incidentally, you have to have a control mechanism that once a tube is filled, that one's closed off, and a set of instructions to get that thing up there so, and connect it so it could be used. Its stomach differentiates food and stinging cells. Folks, your stomach doesn't do that. <laughs> you swallow the wrong thing, it just tries to digest it and, and the stinging cell would go off in your stomach. It has sensing systems that are now adapted to another organism's body cells. And it has to close off the filled tubes, which I told you about. How did this all occur by chance? It couldn't have. It looks designed because it was designed. Do animals and plants negotiate contracts? What we're going to look at is about three sets of symbiotic relationships. Symbiotic relationships mean relationships between animals which are helpful to both. In South America, there are several strains of ferocious ants. One breed lives in the hollow thorns of the bull's horn acacia tree. These are small bumps on a tree that give them food. The hollowed out moms are thorns and the food bumps are all they disturb. They do not go deep into the tree. They do not hurt the tree in any way. They basically only eat the fruit of these thorns or moms. 
In return, the tree is protected from all predators and plant competitors. Any predator harming the tree is swarmed on. If an animal starts to try to eat the bark off these bull's horns acacia tree, the ants come out of the mons in thousands and either kill it or get rid of it. But the second thing they do is very particular to South America. South America rainforests have what's called a canopy effect. The trees are so thick that if you're not at the upper part of the tops of these trees, no light gets down to the bottom of that rainforest. What these ants do is they clear all the competing vegetation around this bull's horn acacia tree so that it not only gets all the water and nutrients it needs, it also gets all the light it needs. And if another plant intrudes upon that clearing they make, they simply go attack it and eat it and get rid of it. Kill the tree, the ant colony dies or moves on. Remove the ants and the tree dies in two to 15 months. My question is, when did the ant colony set up a contract with a tree? How did the tree know to put in the paper that it needed ants? How was this whole thing set up from the start to where the ants would know exactly what that tree needed, which would benefit them and give them food? Notice this little fish has a uh, what there? That's going to become important. They don't really in life, but you're going to get the point. Cleaning symbiosis. This counters food chain theory. You know, food chain theory is that what? The smaller fish is eaten by the bigger fish, and then the bigger fish is eaten by the big whale and all that other kind of stuff. Large fish, barracuda, or sharks will line up and open their mouths, and into their teeth swim cleaner fish and shrimp that will clean out the debris in their teeth. This is very interesting that this would happen with sharks and barracuda because sharks and barracuda will only allow a particular species of cleaner fish or shrimp into their mouth. What happens when anything else living gets near a barracuda or a shark? They eat it. Sharks don't care what they eat. We have torn open the belly of a great white shark. What have we found in there? License plates, tin cans, tires, squid, crayfish, it doesn't care what it eats. And yet, a cleaner fish will come up to it, go right in, eat all the debris out from between its teeth, do its own dental cleaning, and go out. I have several questions here. What was the first cleaner fish that decided that was a nice place to go? <laughs> because what happens to anything else that goes near the mouth of a shark? It gets eaten. So it was a dumb fish that went there the first time. And all that's had to happen over thousands or millions of years, depending upon your point of view, is for the shark to just clamp down and say, ooh, free meal, and the contract would be over. There would be no future cleaner fish, and there would be no future symbiotic relationship. This only works because both the cleaner fish, specific cleaner fish, and the shark are pre-programmed to recognize one another and to do what they're programmed to do. Question, does that look something that could happen by chance or does it look designed? It has ex extreme design to it. It's amazing design. All a barracuda or a shark would have to do in the last several hundred mi million years is close their mouth, get a free meal, and the contract would be over. I say oops by chance because you keep having to remind yourself this is supposed to happen by chance because guess what? It looks all what? Designed. The same cleaning arrangement exists between the Nile crocodile and the Egyptian plover. This is an Egyptian plover. It's a very small bird. Where does this bird like to go to get its meals? Into the mouth of the Nile crocodile. Again, Nile crocodile, let's examine its eating habits. What will a Nile crocodile take a bite out of? Anything. Anything. Human being walks up next to it. Guess what? It's going to take its shot. It doesn't care, and yet it will let this little bird, and only this little bird, come in, pick out all the debris between its teeth, give itself a nice oral cleaning, and then walk out. It won't let a chicken do that. If a chicken walked near, guess what? It has a meal. But the crocodile and the plover are both pre-programmed to allow this symbiotic relationship to work. Folks, who programmed that? God himself. How did this occur by evolution? It couldn't have. Do you really think the plover and the crocodile negotiated a contract? 
That, of course, is absurd. The simple answer is God did this. The monarch butterfly. Incidentally, what is the state insect of Texas? Monarch butterfly. Monarchs lay their eggs on the underside of milkweed leaves. That's the only place they'll lay their eggs. Incidentally, the milkweed plant is poisonous. These eggs hatch in 312 days depending upon the temperature. The larvae eat only milkweed leaves. The larvae must acquire immunity to milkweed. When they are born, they are not immune to the toxins, the poison that's in the milkweed. And so what they do is acquire an immunity to it by eating the toxins very slowly. And here's how they do that. If this is a milkweed leaf, what the larvae, the little caterpillar will do, is it will move over and take a bite out of one side of a leaf. What that milkweed does is start, start pumping toxin to that end of the leaf when it gets bitten on that edge. So what the larvae does is after it takes one and only one bite here, it crosses over diagonally and takes a bite over here while the leaf is pumping toxin to this side. Then the leaf starts pumping toxin to this side where he took a bite, so he takes a, a trip over here and takes a third bite and then a fourth bite, and then he leaves that leaf and goes to another leaf. Did that happen by chance or was he pre-programmed to do that? That is the only way that he could eat a leaf that he is not immune to and be able to get just a little bit of the toxin so he could become immune to the toxin. If he's not pre-programmed with that, what did the first larvae do? They just started eating away and eventually got so much toxin they died and there was no new monarchs. This had to be pre-programmed from the start. He feeds for about two weeks like that on leaves and becomes a two inch long caterpillar. After a while, it attaches itself upside down to a twig. It sheds its outer skin and becomes a pupa or chrysalis, dissolving its internal organs. Incidentally, if you were to do that, dissolve all your internal organs, guess what that's called? Death. This thing has two sets of instructions for two different animals in it and it transforms from one to the other. This amazing transformation is completed in just hours when it gets into the chrysalis and dissolves its internal organs. In the chrysalis it develops not only wings, antennae, and different legs and internal organs but a whole new physiology. There's nothing the same. The eyes aren't the same. Nothing is the same. 24 hours before emerging the chrysalis becomes transparent and you can see it ready to come out. After struggling free from the chrysalis, the butterfly immediately begins to inflate its wings with fluid stored in its swollen abdomen. Let's just take one very small piece of this. If it doesn't have fluid stored in its abdomen, it can't pump it to the wings, the wings can never sprout, it can never fly, and the whole species is gone. But does it also have to have pumps to get it out of the abdomen? Does it have to have a tube system going to the wings? Does this all have to be pre-set up or it can't even spread its wings and fly once it gets out of there and that's just one small function out of a huge trail of thousands of functions that have to occur for this thing to make this transformation. My first mentor in the field was Dr. Dwayne Gish and at debates what he would do during his 15 minute time is he would present the monarch butterfly then he'd turn to the evolutionists and say explain this. And they couldn't and I've only gone halfway through it. They migrate from Texas, Mexico, and Florida where they winter to the north in summer. They follow the same migration pattern each and every year by instinct. But it's not just one monarch that does that because they don't live that long. A typical monarch butterfly starts its life down here in, in northern Mexico, travels through Texas, and lives about eight weeks or more. It dies, has kids, and those kids will traverse another two or three states. They get that far in about eight weeks. Have a third generation that will get this far up into Canada where there will be another generation that will live during the summer up there. Then there is what's called the Methuselah generation that will actually make the trip all the way back down because it will live up to 16 to 17 weeks. So we're talking about a length of five generations that make the trip up and the trip back and they find themselves where their great 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 grandfather started. How did that happen by chance? Do they all have GPS systems in their heads? Incidentally the brain of a monarch butterfly is, is as small as the head of a pin. And yet it does have GPS in it. We have found that the thing actually is attracted we think 
by lodestone amount of magnetic material down here in the mountains of Mexico and it knows how to home in on those along with correct amounts of information on how to get in the upper winds and be able to travel in upper wind categories. It's amazing. They eat milkweed all the way up. They are poisonous to eat and therefore not usually eaten by predators. This incidentally is not a monarch. This is another type of butterfly that is not poisonous but looks like a monarch and guess what? Will birds eat it? No, no they won't because they've tasted monarchs and that's no good. And so this thing has found a set of protection by design simply because it looks like a monarch. Explain how all of this that I've shown you with a monarch happened by chance. It couldn't have. And that's why Dwayne Gish used it in, in all of his debates. Bombardier warfare, beetle warfare. The bombardier beetle has two tailpipes that blast noxious 212 degree gas when threatened. This thing throws boiling gas at its predators when they try to get at it. It mixes hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide. Now you may not be acquainted with hydroquinone, but what is hydrogen peroxide? Do we, some people use that as a uh, anti antiseptic? Yeah. yeah. That is not naturally occurring in a animal. Hydrogen peroxide is something you use to kill bacteria, to kill cells with. So it does not naturally occur in most animals. This amazing little creature, and incidentally they're about this long. This amazing little creature has an anti-inhibitor that allows storage until combustion. What it has is two glands. The glands make hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. They are stored together in these two storage tubes and the way they can store them together because really when you bring these two chemicals together they automatically combust which is the same process we do with rocket engines. With rocket engines we do not have to have an igniter in most cases. In most cases they combust upon contact. What they have is a third chemical, an inhibitor that is inserted when these chemicals are inserted into the storage chamber to make them inert so that they won't react. When, however, he gets attacked, he will pump both of these chemicals into a combustion tube, aim the combustion tube, and he has a fourth chemical that's inserted into the combustion tubes to make the inhibitor go away, it's called an anti-inhibitor, to allow the chemical reaction and make an explosion in its tail. And it does this in bursts because if it let all, everything that was in its storage tubes out at one time, it would blow itself across a room, which would not help the little guy. It might get him away, but it would also hurt him. So he has a design system to where he does this in very controlled bursts of his tail. Incidentally, his tail can turn like that to aim itself. Well, so what happens with this bombardier beetle is this. Some frog says, man, here's a free meal. He chases after him. He's going to go get his free meal. He catches him. Boy, this is going to be good. And then he gets blasted with 212 degrees fiery gas. And of course, the beetle walks away. To expel the gas, he injects both chemicals into two combustion tubes. The anti-inhibitor is added, and the same principle is used with rocket fuels I told you. How did evolution do this? How did this happen by chance? How did this whole, all these set of parts come together? Hundreds or thousands of millions of years with the wrong chemicals. Let's say that he had everything. He has the combustion tubes, he has the chambers to store all the stuff, but he's got the wrong chemicals. He can't get rid of any predators. He might not even live because he's producing the wrong stuff. Again, hydrogen peroxide is not natural in most organisms. What if he does get the right chemicals, but he doesn't have a combustion chamber, so every time he gets scared, he blows himself up? <laughs> Does that help the species go to the next generation? No, it doesn't. It makes for a ludicrous idea. Do you really think this little guy was there in his own chemistry set for millions of years until he got the right chemicals? This makes no sense. Even when the proper chemicals are found, you need the inhibitor. You must now accidentally, for no purpose, develop combustion tubes. Then you need a valve system and muscles to send this stored inhibited chemical to the tubes. Folks, is this going to happen by chance or does it have to be designed? It has to be designed. The unbelievable amount of complication that goes into this thing, it's like God puts his signature on this.
we need the anti-inhibitor out of millions of chemicals. And until all of these accidents occur, it's the 4th of July every time he's attacked. Will this really help the little guy that every time he gets attacked for millions of years, he blows himself up? It wouldn't. But this is what would be happening if all of this stuff was only a piece at a time and you did not have all the pieces in place from the start. You would not have a next generation. Does it make sense for a species to instinctively self-destruct when attacked for several million years? No, there would be no survival. This thing looks designed because it was designed from the start. Woodpeckers, how do they chip through wood without banging their brains out? How do they keep their aim? All good questions. How does he just keep that from happening? His beak ends up getting beat up. Because if you've ever watched these little guys, I mean, they're pecking away hard on wood. How does he keep his eyes from getting knocked out? Because truthfully, there's enough force when he's hitting his head against that wood to knock his eyes out, literally. What designs are there to stop that? Well, the first piece of design is he has tremendously strong and sharp talons that will grab onto the wood because he has to have a base from which to inflict the kind of blows that he needs to peck through wood. If we were to design a woodpecker, what would we design? Well, we'd give him a strong set of talons to grasp the wood. We would give him a strong tail so that he would have what? A three-prong base from which to peck from. We would give him some type of chisel to jackhammer to go into the wood, and we would give him what? Goggles to protect his eyes and to keep his eyes in. Well, let's see what God did. God gave him a tongue, an extremely long tongue. Why would he give him an extremely long tongue? Yeah, the whole purpose to him pecking into the wood is he's going after worms and insects in that wood. So he has to have an extremely long tongue to go get it. And I'm going to show you some amazing things about that tongue. But before I go on to that, let's look at what else God's done. He gave him a rigid tail so that not only could he grasp the wood with his four talons, he could also have a tripod set up with his tail to where he has a base. His eyes have two eyelids, a translucent inner eyelid and an outer eyelid so that he can aim all the way up to the moment of contact when his second eyelid closes to keep his eyes from being knocked out. And he has a beak designed to take the punishment of knocking into wood. What if he just doesn't have one of these things? He doesn't have the proper eyelids. His eyes get knocked out. No new bird. What if he doesn't have a tail that's rigid? He can't peck into wood. What if he's got a beak that won't stand up to the punishment? Well, he gets one meal, but that's it. The rest of life, no meals. I've got to go with nothing. None of this works until it's all designed. On that extremely long tongue that will reach all the way into wood, he has a cupping mechanism that will allow him to grasp worms and insects and also has a type of glue on the end to grab them. Question is, where do you store that long a tongue? Well. In most, not all, but in most woodpeckers, they store it all the way around their head into the front top beak inside their head. This serves two purposes. One, it's where they store this long tongue, because you can't just walk around like Tony Parker when he shoots a free throw with your tongue hanging out. They don't walk around with their tongue hanging out. They have a place to store it, but second, what does this dual tongue set up around the brain? A shock absorber says when he hits the wood, he is cushioned to where he does not blow his brains out. It's a beautiful setup. Question, how did all this happen by chance? It didn't. It's designed, and it had to be designed this way with all the parts from the very start. How did this, all this happen by chance? It didn't. How did it survive until its beak, tongue, brain, eyes, tail, and all had fully developed? It couldn't have. It was designed from the start by the Creator. Giraffe's blood. Giraffes grow up to 18 feet tall. How does it get its blood up to its head when it's standing up? It does so because it has the most powerful pump heart of all mammals. It has a two and a half foot long heart which weighs 25 pounds which will pump that blood up to 18 feet in the air. It has the highest blood pressure in animals and the thickest vessel walls of any mammal. 
It has one-way valves in its neck and arteries, like veins. You may not know this, but your veins and your legs have one-way valves. Because what happens during the low pressure cycle of your heartbeat between beats is the blood is being pumped up from your feet back up after it's already given oxygen to your body. It's being pumped back up to the heart and lungs. But between beats it loses pressure and so you have one-way valves that open when your heart's beating and when it stops beating it closes so that the blood can't back up in your veins. Giraffes have that same type of system in its arteries. Arteries are the ones that take oxygenated blood from the heart to the tissues and veins are the ones that return it back to the heart. He has these one-way valves in his, in his arteries. So when it's, blood is being pumped up its neck between pumps, it will not back up. He has enough blood pressure to burst all the blood vessel in his brain when he bends down. Now here's a huge problem. It takes a huge amount of pressure to get that blood up 18 feet in the air, but when he bends down to get a drink, the force of gravity along with the force of that 25 pound pump of his heart is so great that if he wasn't designed for it, he would literally blow his brains out every time he bent down to get a drink. Is that good for the species if it's going to blow its brains out every time he gets a drink? Won't work. Fortunately, when he lowers his head, two things happen. Those valves close, and so the pressure from the heart is gone, and the blood which is still speeding on its way to his head hits a sponge-like group of vessels in the back of his head. It hits this sponge, and what happens when water hits a sponge? It gets greatly slowed down, and it slowly diffuses through the sponge and gives oxygenated blood to the brain, but does not blow the brain out. Beautiful design. Well, that works when he bends down. Now he sees a lion coming after him, and he raises his head up. The problem is, when he raises his head up suddenly, fluid pressure in his brain prevents the capillaries from bursting good, but when he sees that lion coming, when he raises his head instantly, there should be no blood in his brain, and he should pass out. Incidentally, if he passes out with that lion coming at him, what happens? He dies. The lion eats him. So that's a very bad design except when he raises up three things happen. The arterial valves open so now there is no longer a close off of the blood coming from the heart. It's now racing up to his head. Problem is it's got to get 18 feet in the air. That sponge-like set of capillaries at the back of his head the minute he raises up automatically squeezes out all the blood that's in it to give him instant oxygen to his brain so he doesn't pass out. And the veins that are going down his neck do close off to keep back pressure so that the blood that's in his head stays up there until the blood in the arteries can get up there to him. Question, did all this design have to be there from the start? It had to be. Otherwise, every time he bent down to get a drink, he blew his brains out, no new giraffe, and every time he saw a predator, he raised up, passed out, and it was a free meal for whatever came. All of this had to be designed from the start. There's no time for it to be a piece at a time like evolution said it was. How many giraffes had to blow out their brains or pass out before it was all developed by chance? The number incidentally is zero because he was designed this way from the start. He is not, he, it was designed and he is not viable until fully functional. What do I mean by viable? It won't work. He can't live until it's all here. What do these animals tell us? They did not evolve a little at a time. They were all designed fully formed. They are not viable. They cannot live until they're fully formed with all the pieces and all, and all of the organs and all of the process systems. They plainly show design and the creator. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. The people are saying, where is God? All you got to do is look at the design of the trees and all the animals in creation, and you can see it, but we are willfully what? Blind and ignorant. We don't want to see it all too often, because that would make us responsible to him.